Great. So thanks again uh, to everyone for joining us this evening. Um, our speaker will be Jen Foreman Orth, who I'll introduce in a moment. Uh, I'd like to say just very briefly a little bit about uh, beetles here. They're a fascinating group of insects. They're really the largest uh, animal order in on the planet. Uh, incredibly diverse, both taxonomically and in terms of their life histories and ecology. Uh, Bug Guide says there are 390,000 described species. There are probably quite a few undescribed species too. Uh, 25,000 species in North America and upwards of 3,700 in Massachusetts. So that's a, that's a lot of variety. That's a lot of species. Uh, I noted that the Martha's Vineyard Atlas of Life project in iNaturalist currently only has 289 species represented. So we have some work to do. I'm sure that is a dramatic undercount for Martha's Vineyard. Um, and one of the hopes with this series of webinars is that we're giving people the inspiration and hopefully some of the skills they need to start doing work of their own, documenting additional species here on the vineyard. Um, uh, Jen Foreman Orth is professionally uh, invasive species biologist with the Massachusetts Department of Agricultural Resources. But like me, she is uh, leads a second life as an amateur naturalist, and that's the capacity in which she's with us tonight. Um, she's presenting on one of her personal passions. I mentioned that she's a pretty knowledgeable beetle person. And uh, I also mentioned the Mass Beetles website. Uh, it's massbeetles.com. It's the easiest URL in the world, which is a searchable uh, county level database of beetle records It's uh, for Massachusetts. So it's an incredible resource. Uh, that, that Jen has taken the time and effort to uh, do as a personal project. And she's here tonight with us as a personal project too, for which I'm uh, extremely grateful. Uh, and I hope you enjoy her presentation. And I would say, Jen, if you're ready to roll, why don't you start sharing your screen? How's that look? Looks good. All right, I'm going to collapse my little attendee window myself, actually. Um, I'll warn you guys, these slides take up a lot of the screen, so you might find that you need to collapse the little window that shows who's speaking. I'm going to turn my video off anyway, just for bandwidth, but all right, let's get started. Um, thanks, Matt, for the, for the really nice introduction and also for inviting me to speak to your group today. I'm going to be talking to you about a guide that I've built to the Order Coleoptera in Massachusetts, or the beetles of Massachusetts. So before I get into the, the meat of things, I thought it would be interesting to tell you how this whole thing started. Basically, back in 2018, I was having kind of a, a silly conversation with a friend about, you know, how do you know when you found a beetle that might be new to Massachusetts, like a species record. A lot of us that track insects, photograph insects, um, we get a little competitive about things and it's always very exciting. If you're a birder, you know exactly what I'm talking about, right? Because you not only keep a life list, but a lot of you keep year lists where you just restart every year to see how many species you could find. So you know, for beetles, we were just curious, like, what, how do I know? Is this a county record? Is this a state record? There's no, there was no place to look it up. And the online sources that are available, you know, back then they were very incomplete. They're still pretty incomplete. Places like bugguide.net and of course, inaturalist.org are places where people are reporting that they found beetles and all kinds of other insects all over the state. Um, I just thought, you know, what if I pulled all the bug guide records? Like maybe, maybe I could get a list going that way. Honestly, in 2018, iNaturalist hadn't really blown up yet. Um, and here's a beetle right here that I, I found on the side of my house one day that I thought might be a new record, at least for the county. That turned out not to be true. <laughs> but at the time, I was very excited that it might be. Um, because there were no records for it online that I could find. And in terms of just thinking how big of a project this, this would be, I, Matt already kind of got into it a little bit, maybe he stole my thunder. 
<laughs> but let's say you're just interested in the in like the reptiles and amphibians of Massachusetts. That's 45 species. That's easy. If you're looking at the birds of Massachusetts, that's about 512 species. If you're looking at an insect order like the moths of Massachusetts, the Lepidoptera, to 2,952 species and counting, that's a separate project not affiliated with me, but if you want to check it out, it's massmoths.org. Um, and so I thought, well, the, I wonder if there are more beetles than moths? I have no idea. I reached out to Mike Nelson, who's an entomologist at Mass Wildlife, and I asked him, like, how many, is there a checklist? No, there wasn't a checklist. How many beetles do you think there'd be? He's, he said, oh, you know, maybe 2,000 or, or 2,500 or so. That's a lot. And, and honestly, looking back, I, I think, why, why didn't, why was that not enough to stop me from starting this project? Because, you know, if you think about trying to just do a hundred of anything, it's a lot, but a thousand of anything is a huge task. And yet here I was embarking on this adventure where I might be listing, you know, 2000 different species of something. And I don't know, it, it was winter. I will say in my defense, it was winter when I first did the data poll from bugguide.net of all the Massachusetts beetle records and winter is a terrible time for naturalists in in New England right because there's not I mean you're you're downstairs in your basement trying to find new spider species right if you're into insects and arthropods. Um, and so I I convinced my husband to do what is called a, a page scrape he wrote some code he's a software engineer and he wrote some code that scraped all of the bug guide pages and dumped it into a set of spreadsheets. It was 13,000 records. Um, and then I went through it all and I, I kind of compiled it and I was like, all right, you know, is there more stuff out there? Turned out there's a, a huge online database from the Museum of Comparative Zoology at Harvard. So I grabbed all of those records. There were a lot of great old records in there and a lot of data from the Boston Harbor Islands. And then I discovered that there was actually a whole inventory of the Boston Harbor Islands. So I grabbed that too. And then I reached out to, to Tom Murray, who's possibly the top naturalist in, in Massachusetts. He's written books on insects. Um, he lives in the same county I do. So I never get to have a county record of anything because he's already found it. It's it's almost always true. It's always this amazing victory if you find something that Tom Murray hasn't found. Uh, but I reached out to him and he gave me his list of species that he's found. And um, I started to do some literature searches and pull things out of the literature. By 2020, about two years later, I had 1,143 species. And I thought, well, it took me like, two years to get through this, but what has maybe happened since then? Because when I pulled the data, it was from 2018. So, and honestly, by then, iNaturalist had become really, really popular. So many species, new species records per day that I couldn't even really follow all the records from Massachusetts on my iNaturalist dashboard anymore. It was just too much. But I did another data poll. Um, Data polls from iNaturalist are really easy. I can do them on my own. Anyone can do them. It's nice. But for Bug Guide, this time, instead of doing the page scraping, I actually reached out to some of the data managers there, and they sent me the data. Uh, and I did another really deep dive into the published literature to see how many more lists I could find. And I got some help from some folks that pointed me to sources. Um, and this picture is another. Actually, I believe it is a county record for Middlesex County, a gorgeous little jewel beetle, Chrysobothrus azuria. Um, it's finds like this that keep me going on this project when it just seems like it's way too big. And after five years, mass beetles is currently 3,718 unique beetle species in 900 different families. At this point, I've ma amassed 76 different sources, including every online database I can find. So Bug Guide and iNaturalist and the Global Biodiversity Information Facility, 
I have multiple print sources, everything from books and um, reports to peer reviewed journal articles. I have gotten a few folks to send me their personal data collections that aren't published anywhere. And I follow a lot of identification groups in social media and places like Reddit and Facebook to get any record I can and integrate it into the database. So here's a, a massive graph just to show you what 98 families of beetles looks like. This is the mass beetle families ranked by number of species. I guess I don't expect you to get a whole lot out of the tiny little words here, except to note that, you know, it's interesting. There's obviously some families that are very well represented and some families that are either really small or that just don't have a lot of species in Massachusetts. And I just thought it would be nice to go in and go through some of the most common beetle families in the state for you guys. So the top five beetle families by number of species in Massachusetts are the Staphylinidae, which are the rogue beetles, the Carabidae, which are ground beetles, the Curculionidae, which are the weevils, the Chrysomelidae, or the leaf beetles, and then the Cerambicidae, or the longhorn beetles. But the most common family by far is certainly the rogue beetles. And then I thought it'd be interesting to compare this, like is Massachusetts different from say all of North America? And you can get that information. There's, there's a, a document that was published online, it's probably a decade old, called the Nomina Insecta Nearctica. Uh, and when you put everything in order, you see that it's a lot of the same family. So Massachusetts isn't that much different from North America as a whole. I haven't run the stats on this, um, yet, but I just wanted to kind of show you a comparison. I mean, the Staphylinidae or the rogue beetles are still the most common family in North America. And then the ground beetles and weevils switch places, followed by the leaf beetles. And then the darkling beetles um, are fifth place in North America. And then just for comparison, I pulled up the data for how common they are in Massachusetts. And they're about 2% of the data set at this point. Um, and then just for comparison, this, the longhorn beetles are actually seventh place when you look at the records for all of North America. So let's learn a little bit more about some of these really populous families in, of beetles in Massachusetts, just starting off with the rogue beetles or the Staphylinidae. Uh, I love showing off this beetle first because to me, it looks like it's wearing formal wear. <laughs> and a lot, if I you go back to the road beetle slide, a, a lot of these beetles are, you know, they, they live their lives like in leaf litter on the ground. And you see that they have like a, you know, there's a, there's a color scheme here for the most part, right? Black, brown, beiges, grays, and things like that. But then you get some of them that just kind of pop. This is Philanthus cerulepennis. Um, like a lot of rove beetles, they are, they eat carrion and fungi and, and things like that. So they're not eating, you know, they're not going to be your garden pests. They're just kind of helping break down things in the natural world and reincorporating them into themselves. Um, I think what's really cool about this beetle, not just the fact that it has these wing covers that are this amazing like teal metallic shade, but when you look at a lot of beetles, you'll see that well, so I don't know, probably a good way to compare it is if you look at something like a, a dragonfly or a bee that has two sets of translucent wings. Beetles have evolved to have one set of translucent wings and then these wing covers that are called elytra that are these sort of hard sclerotized protective shields over the translucent wings. And what you'll notice on this rove beetle here is that the wing covers are, they only go a few millimeters down the length of the abdomen. And that means that 
a lot of and a lot of you'll see that on a lot of these rove beetles you'll see it here and i'm pointing with my mouse part i'm not entirely sure you can see but if you look you can see this little bump in the center of these rove beetles that is the wing covers and because they're so short they have to manage to fold their entire set of translucent under wings under that tiny little compartment so i call it wing origami and i think it's really cool that they still manage to hide those wings under there another common rove beetle and this is something you might actually have seen and, and maybe not realized it was a rove beetle is um, occipus nitens this is an introduced species from europe that is a, a synanthrope so it it's not a like a, a home pest but it's just one of those species that seems to be attracted to house houses and, and sheds and building and stuff like that and so you'll just kind of see them running along the side of your house or running along your garage door when you open it in places like that they don't there's they don't cause any harm to people or, or anything like that they just seem to like the habitat um, and they'll scatter when you shine a flashlight on them this is another really cool rove beetle Anthelestes cingulatus it's actually a pretty big insect, about an inch or so long. Um, and I'm showing it on fungi, but it doesn't actually eat fungi, even though a lot of rove beetles do. Um, I think this is an eastern stink horn. That's, that's probably why I'm not showing the whole picture. I'm, I cropped it out years ago because it's kind of R-rated if you ever look at a stink horn. Um, just Google it after this talk. Anyway, they're attracted to fungi because the flies that they like to eat are attracted to fungi. They're also sometimes called, um, what is it, pie beetles because they're attracted to cow pies or cow patties. But again, they're just going to these uh, places because that's where flies like to go and then they eat the flies. The next family I want to talk to you about is the ground beetles. Again, another insect that tends to be found like in leaf litter, in sorry, in leaf litter, running along um, pavement in the grass, places like that. They're not typically up in trees or anything like that. They're running along the ground. They're unlike the rove beetles. They tend to be predators. They'll eat, capture, and eat live prey. This is, a, you know, what you're you're in the vineyard, so. You guys see way too many species of tiger beetles. Totally unfair that you have that much species diversity there. But this is the one that I see most often. And also, I should note that the tiger beetles used to be in their own family, but were folded into the Carabidae um, a long time ago. Just in case you're wondering why they're showing up as ground beetles, you might just know them as tiger beetles. Um, the one I get in my yard is this six spotted tiger beetle. Um, they're super fast, really good at catching prey, and also really good at running away from my camera. So these are the only two good shots I have of them, uh, but they're really neat. A fun fact about these is that they're sometimes reported to the state as being emerald ash borer just because they're green, um, but they don't really look anything like emerald ash borer other than the color. Another ground beetle that you might actually be familiar with is well, it's the entire Harpalus genus, um, excuse me, genus. Again, these are, this is something that you're going to see like on your porch, around the porch light, they or around your house, but they're not house pests. They're just kind of attracted to habitats like that. They're looking for other insects to eat. Um, they're very skittish, and if you shine a light on them, they will scoot away. And I like to show this slide because it shows the amazing morphological diversity in this family. So most of the ground beetles you see are going to look like these guys, just black. They might have orange feet or they might just have black feet. But then you have ones that have an incredible green metallic set of wing covers on them, like Caliida punctata. You have Caliurus pennsylvanica that basically looks like a giraffe version of a beetle. And you have this Scaridae species with its incredibly large, powerful set of jaws that is a pretty fierce predator. 
doesn't really look like a ground beetle. I think if folks saw it, they would mistake it for like a stag beetle, if you're familiar with those. The next family I want to cover are the weevils. I often say they're my favorite, but I'm probably going to say that about the longhorn beetles too. Um, weevils are really, I don't know, they're super cute. They're really cool because most of them have adapted these, you know, incredibly long um, proboscis. Sometimes they stick out, sometimes they stick down. They just are looking kind of silly with these appendages and I think they're adorable. Uh, this is an acorn weevil. There are many different acorn weevils all in the Curculio genus, which is actually a really big genus. This one in particular is a female. The males have a much shorter proboscis. The whole point of having this super long proboscis is to drill into acorns and lay your eggs so that your larva can develop inside this nice comfy acorn habitat and then pupate and chew their way out as adults. There are an amazing size, range, shape, and color of weevils. This is another Curculio that's been since placed in another genus, the, the Conotriculus, which is in itself a really large genus of, um, of weevils. This is the Cambium Curculio, so-called, because it tends to burrow into the bark of the tree past um, past the bark, but into the cambium layer or conductive layer of, of trees and shrubs. Just to give you a sense of how tiny this species is, I'm showing you a picture in the center of one of them that is hitchhiking on a, a crane fly, which I was pretty impressed by. This is actually um, sometimes a pest of fruit trees, and this is one of the families of beetles where you have a lot of different pest species. Um, here on the left, we have another conotraculus that attacks butternut and walnut trees, as indicated by its specific epithet, Jaglandus. And then Posticatus is another conotraculus that is a pest of oak trees. But then there's also an apple curculio and a plum curculio. And either one of these sometimes rise to the level of being pests in fruit orchards. But then we've also kind of turned this pest status around to work for us in several cases. These are two very tiny and dare I say very adorable <laughs> weevils. Uh, the one on the left is a, a mullein weevil that was purposely released in America to um, as a biocontrol for what is it verbascus it's um mul yeah common mullein verbascus scandens I think it it also attacks all kinds of other plants in the the scrofulary aceae so the snapdragon family uh, and the one on the right is is one that I've actually released and and Allie who's on this um on this webinar in the audience is was also somebody that has released this particular biocontrol this is the mile a minute vine weevil that was reared as a biocontrol to combat mile a minute vine um which is something that was found in massachusetts back in i think 2002 and has become quite a widespread invasive plant here Okay, the chrysomelody. Oh, right. I forget that when I say weevils are my favorite, and I also like longhorn beetles, that chrysomelids always kind of blow me away with, I, they are just the best dressed beetles, I would say, out of all these different families that you're going to see. But leaf beetles also are a whole lot of pest insects. Um, tortoise beetles are maybe the coolest leaf beetles. I don't know. This one's got the little teddy bear pattern on the wing covers. Um, you can see where they're called tortoise beetles. They look like little turtles or tortoises. Um, but these guys love tomatoes, tomatillos, eggplants. So any any plant in the Solanaceae, they're going to attack and 
eat the leaves and, and can often rise to the level of doing significant damage if they're left untreated. The really neat and gross thing about a lot of leaf beetles, including the clavate tortoise beetle, is that they use this, I guess the, the fancy name for it is a fecal shield. They're basically pooping on their backs to discard predators for attacking them. <laughs> I think it's pretty effective, but it's pretty gross. And I know this is, I, I wanted to show you this so much that this is the one photo here on the right that isn't one that I took myself because I didn't have a picture of this species in the, the larval stage. But, um, you know, if you know lily leaf beetles, they do the same thing. They have this like gross sludge on top of them that they're purposely putting on their backs so that nobody bothers them. And it's pretty effective even for humans. Some of the other chrysomelids that we have here in Massachusetts that are fairly common garden pests are things like the Colorado potato beetle and both the striped and spotted cucumber beetle, which are pests of pretty much any cucurbitus plant, so not just cucumbers, but squash and pumpkins and things like that too. But then here are species that aren't considered pests that are just gorgeous. I mean, they're still damaging the, the plants that are their host plants, but they're very cool looking, including the rainbow colored metallic dog bean beetle on the left, the swamp milkweed leaf beetle in the middle, and the very funky looking 14 spotted leaf beetle on the right. That's a photo of an insect that just showed up on our gas grill cover one day, and I couldn't believe what, how cool it looked. All right, the final family I'm going to introduce you to today is the longhorn beetle family or the Cerebicidae. Um, they're called longhorn beetles because they have really long antenna that are often as long as or even longer than their bodies. And this is one you might have seen if you have common milkweed around your property. Um, this is again it's it's a a longhorn beetle and it is feeding mainly on the roots of common milkweed and it'll actually kill them if if the population levels are high enough but it's a native species and it does really well on milkweed i think it i don't know someone was saying we should start a campaign and say save the red milkweed beetles instead of save the monarchs but i don't know there are plenty of things that are really cool that are using milkweed in addition to monarchs that deserve our attention as well. Another longhorn beetle that you might have heard of is the Asian longhorn beetle. This is a you know federally and state regulated invasive pest that we have here in Massachusetts in the greater Worcester area. It attacks maple trees and it is currently the subject of a massive eradication program in that part of the state. But wow, I mean, look how showy this thing is. It's bright, shiny black with white spots and super long antenna with cool blue stripes on it. Um, so I'm glad we're getting rid of it, but I have to admit it was kind of amazing the first time I saw one. And then you also in the same family have these little tiny cerebicids like Obrium ruffulum doesn't even have a common name. It's a, uh, it uses ash as a host. A, a lot of cerambicids are, are wood boring insects, so they bore into the wood of trees or shrubs. Um, and this is a species that, for whatever reason, is attracted to light. So it showed up actually two different years just under my porch light. Very, very neat looking insect. All right. So I'm calculating that at this point, been about half an hour of me talking about beetles. You're probably fully convinced that you want to go try to find some of these really cool beetles too. I don't think I'm going too far by saying that. Um, so I figured I'm going to talk to you about where you can look for beetles. So you can get out there, maybe take some photos, add some records to iNaturalist. I'm going to talk more about why Martha's Vineyard needs to do that in a few more slides. Uh, but here are some of the ways that you can look for beetles. Um, I admit it, I'm very lucky. 
I have some really cool friends that are doing professional black lighting. Um, you know, you go out into the, a, a good field someplace, you set up a white sheet with a light that is putting out UV wavelengths, you know, something like a mercury vapor lamp or um, a UV tube light or metal halide or something like that. And, and look, my friends are doing it to find moths, but there are plenty of beetles that are attracted to lights like this. And so I'm really, you know, lucky that I can accompany them on some of these um, sojourns into the field at night to find really cool insects. Um, here are some of the examples of things that are attracted to light, things like um, at the bottom, this very large click beetle, Paludius pyros. Uh, in the top left, this so weirdly shaped, it's like a diamond shaped beetle. I was really caught off guard the first time I saw it. It turns out it's a, an aquatic beetle that for some reason, it just gets pulled into lights when it's out flying at night. And then on the right, we have a what's called a fungus weevil. It's in its own family. It's not a Kerkulion nid. It's in the uh, Anthribidae. Um, I challenge you to dispute the cuteness of this fuzzy beetle with the white face and the super wide snout. I think fungus weevils are really cute. They are actually burrow into the wood of trees and then get behind the woody parts of, of polypore fungi that are growing on the trees and that's why they're called fungus weevils but any of those species just they're for, for whatever reason they they come to lights but let's say you don't have a friend doing their phd research involving black lighting out in state parks and you still want to try this on your own there are things you can do to attract beetles and, and other insects to light. Um, one of the things I've done around my house is swap out these, um, the, the lights on my um, porch and, and shed and places like that with very simple, very cheap CFL black light bulbs. There's a little adapter on the bottom just because the, the light on my shed had a was like a weird candelabra type light. But anyway, I mean, you can get those at any hardware store and just swap them in, turn them on and weird things will show up at your porch like that you've never seen before. Another thing you can do is set up what they call a pitfall trap. I'll be honest, I had never done this myself until this season and I, it was exciting because I started seeing species I was never gonna see because they aren't attracted to lights and you don't see them um species that you don't see any place with basically on the ground and all that this involves is taking a small container and digging a hole in the ground setting the container so that the top of it is flush with the soil and you don't see the cover here but there's a few rocks around it and then you just put a cover on top so that it, it you don't want it to fit tightly you just want to shield it from the rain and if you set up a pitfall trap you might see things like ground beetles and rove beetles and scarab beetles. The really freaky looking thing on the bottom is, is actually the larva of a rove beetle. Um, they look very strange when they're, before they become adults. The one on the top left is a type of ground beetle that has a crazy giant head and giant eyes, kind of similar to tiger beetles. And then this scarab is a dung feeding beetle that showed up in it was a, a male and a female pair inside one of my pitfall traps um a couple months ago and it's got this really neat like forked appendage coming out of its um out of the pronotum and it's really cool they're both of these adults are this amazing metallic color anyway it was, it was really exciting to kind of open up a new part of the coleoptera that i hadn't seen or had a chance to photograph before now there are also beetles that you're going to find living in trees or in shrubs and again a lot of these are you know they're they're feeding on fungi on trees or they're boring into the trees and so one of the ways that you can try to see what's out there is using what they call a, a beet sheet and it's just a like a canvas square with um 
with two wooden bars that kind of stretch it out tightly, but it, you can do the same thing with an upside down umbrella. You just place something like that out under a tree or shrub and then you either shake it, which I'm gonna do a demo here. Although you're not gonna see what I got when I shook it because it was just a bunch of spiders and I didn't wanna talk about spiders today. Um, anyway, you can do that. The other thing you can do is you can get a, a wooden bar or a PVC pipe and you could just bang really hard on um, the branches of a tree and, and stuff will fall out. And then you get to see what it is. Um, it, it works really well with um, wood that's been damaged, but just be careful that you're not causing something to break over your head if you're gonna try something like that. And here are a few examples of things that I've found in the beat sheets. It, it also, if you don't wanna go and shake the tree, just go stand under a tree that has leaves close to your head and shine a flashlight and you will see stuff there you didn't realize was living its whole life in a tree right next to your house. So things like this death watch beetle on the left or the, the two banded Japanese weevil, which is a, a wicked pest in, in my yard. It eats the margins of leaves and you can see like on the lilac shrub in my front yard, pretty much every leaf doesn't look like a normal leaf shape. It just has munch marks along it. And if you go out at night with a flashlight, you can see dozens of these little beetles eating in all different parts of the shrub. Uh, or you might find something like this really cool net winged beetle. Sort of looks like a firefly, but a completely different family. Or you could use a sweep net. You could look in fields and grassy areas um on your own or you could incorporate a sweep net if you can't get a professional entomology sweep net you could just get you know a kid's butterfly net at the store and have just as much fun with it um here's what it looks like to kind of beat around in some shrubbery these are this is a native honeysuckle shrub keep in mind i was doing this with one hand while i was trying to record it to show you what it looked like. So it's a bit messy. Uh, and then you just kind of flip it over. There's a bonus um, Acanthocephalus terminalis. So there was just a squash bug on the outside of the net, but not a beetle. So we're not gonna talk about it anymore. Um, whoops, let me go to the next slide. Oh yeah, okay. So here's the two coolest things that I found this year using a sweep net in some um, hay fields that I was in. The one on the right is a goldenrod leaf miner. That looks like a race car. I mean, the coloration on that thing is is crazy. That's they're both leaf beetles, so Chris and Mallard family. The little guy on the right is the most adorable poop mimic you've ever seen. It basically looks like insect or or rodent poop, and it has evolved to look that way. And if you startle it, it tucks everything in its antenna and legs, so it really just you can't tell unless you're really close when it's not moving, if it is an insect or if it is fecal matter. Uh, another thing you can do is go and look in your gardens, go check your flowers. We talk a lot about pollinators and for most people that means just bees, but there are plenty of beetles that you will find out there providing pollinator support for both native and non-native plants. Um, two of the ones I thought would be most interesting to show you would be the, the black locust borer on the top here. This is actually native to the southeast and came up to the northeast along with black locust, um, Rubinia pseudoacacia, which is a, 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 a tree, a leguminous tree. <clears throat> so you know, in the pea and bean family that is an invasive species here. And it just brought along this really cool um, longhorn beetle that bores into the wood. And for whatever reason, this black and yellow beetle prefers to feed on goldenrod. So if you look at late flowering goldenrod, I'm not sure if they're here yet, but within the next couple of weeks, you should see black locust borer on those goldenrod flowers feeding on nectar and pollen. And then 
the Serambicids also have this entire other subfamily called the flower longhorn beetles or the, the Lepturini. And the insect on the bottom is just another example of that, Anna Leptura lineola. The gorgeous skinny longhorn beetle. But there are probably several dozen that we get in uh, in Massachusetts that are flower longhorns of various sizes, shapes, and colors. You can also just look down. And these are two examples of weird and crazy things I found just in my own yard. The top one is a bluegrass bill bug, which again, a weevil, and I think it's absolutely adorable, but it turns out it's it can be a major turf pest. But I was just outside with my dogs a few weeks ago, and I saw this little insect run across from onto the patio from the grass. And I was like, that doesn't look like a ground beetle and I grabbed it and threw it in a vial and brought it out for its little glamour shot session in my light box later and it turned out to be a, a weevil I had never seen before. And then the bottom picture is just to show you this, so this is a, a ground beetle, just a very common genus of ground beetles, Terastichus, and it is attempting to take out a giant leopard moth caterpillar. So that caterpillar was still alive and the ground beetle was attempting to drag it across the leaf litter and they were just fighting. I think I watched them for about half an hour and then kind of gave up and went in. Um, so I don't know who won that battle, but it's just it was just a really cool observation. So I always tell folks, you know, look up, but also look down. OK. So let's look a little closer at the mass beetles database and let me do a time check and wow I am running a lot longer than I thought I was going to be. This is a list of the most widespread species in the mass beetles database so of the the beetles of Massachusetts, the ones that have been found in every single county and. I've kind of separated them by color based on what family they're in and you'll see it's a lot of stuff I've been talking to you about today right the longhorn beetles the leaf beetles. Um, but also things that I mean I think these are things that you. Most of you've probably seen like whoops clicked on the wrong thing there. Um, the third beetle down, this is a winter firefly it's a, a diurnal lightning bug so it doesn't light up and it's active during the day and it's something that you not only see all over massachusetts but at almost every single month of the year like even in february if it's a warm day these guys are going to be out sunning themselves on the trunk of an oak tree and this so this list of the most widespread species got me thinking what if I looked at the things were, that were in like 13 out of 14 counties and then tried to get people to fill in the gaps because I'd like to have records in every single county for them. It would be like a challenge. And I pulled, I pulled this data up. I know it's a giant table. It's a lot to take in. But there's a few things I want to tell you about. First is that when I originally did this table, now I'm about two years late i need to do another iNaturalist and bug guide data poll i haven't done it for about two years and i i, th I think this shows that there's going to be a lot of new records there which is kind of exciting but every time you do the data poll it's another ten thousand plus records it takes a long time to go through so i haven't done it yet um it's what i'm going to be doing this winter but when i pulled this table up originally there were a whole bunch of missing boxes in Dukes County and I was kind of excited because I was like I'm going to tell everybody in this talk like you got to go find like the Colorado potato beetle or something and then I was like oh before I do that I'm just going to go check iNaturalist and bug guide one more time and it turns out there were a whole bunch of places where you guys have iNaturalist records in there and I don't know it the popularity of iNaturalist is just so widespread at this point that there are a lot of species like for Barnstable County there just weren't a lot of records and now you can see pretty much every Barnstable County record is coming just from iNaturalist which I thought was really cool. The other thing is that I definitely need to 
maybe give this talk on Nantucket because they're they're missing a lot of records of very common things that I feel like they must have and they, there's just nobody there to like put a record someplace so that's something I definitely want to work on but I have nothing to tell you guys to work on at this point in Dukes County because you have all these really common species already um, so a little bit more about Martha's Vineyard who is collecting beetle records like where are they coming from if they're on the vineyard and the other thing is now i i in my database i have 164 species that have records from the vineyard and i heard matt mention that there is a data source that i'm going to need to get after this talk um and rather than think oh i got the data wrong i'm just going to say well of course things are missing um and i'm going to need to update my data but that said I just I guess I find it hard to believe that the difference in terms of what Martha's Vineyard has is just like 200 something species or 300 something species versus 164 considering that I have close to 4,000 species in my state database you guys have got to have a lot more beetle species there than you really have records for so it you know I might say you should be checking out using things like iNaturalist and, and getting more vineyard beetle records on there. Uh, but in general, iNaturalist is the place to go if you want to see records for Dukes County. Um, bug guide is a close second, but a lot of the bug guide records are old. So when people are looking for a citizen science database these days to put information in, they tend to go to iNaturalist and not bug guide. Uh, also, there, you know, there's a some print information some print sources that have information about the vineyard like the beetles of northeastern north america um which is a, a two volume set that had a lot of great info about many parts of the state including the vineyard um goldstein and simmons did an amazing study of the scarabidae um the scarab beetles just specifically for the offshore islands in Massachusetts. So there's a lot of Dukes County records there. And then there's not too much else um, in terms of representation, although a, a, a few reports from, from Matt, so thanks Matt. And one record I got from somebody off of Facebook that was a really cool um, agrolis record or jewel beetle record. But in, you know, I had expected to have more vineyard specific sources when I started and I I'm lacking that so I'm looking forward to to finding out if there are things that I need to add to my data collection. Okay, so we're at 750 I'm going to attempt to give you a tour of the mass beetles website for the next five minutes or so, and so I think what I need to do is I need to stop sharing and then I need to share again. And then Matt, if once I do come back on, if you could just be like, hey, yeah, I see the website, then that would help me know that I can proceed with the rest of the talk. Will do. Yeah, I can see the website. Okay, great. All right. So again, this is mathbeetles.com. And yeah, I, I can't believe I got that domain name and it was available because not a lot of short domain names are available these days. But anyway, um, this is the online version of what is essentially a ginormous Google spreadsheet with all of the data that I have collected. Um, and again, it, it, you know, the top of it always tells you the last date it was updated, how many records it has, how many species it has, how many families it has. I do want to say like the, the county level data is still being populated and a lot of it is missing. So if you don't see something in, in a county you think is there, it's just because I haven't gotten there yet. It's just, it's a lot of data to try to parse out. Uh, so I thought we would search for genus Agrilis, which is in the jewel beetle family. There's a search window up at the top. You can search for pretty much anything. And once it's there, you can sort things by any of these fields, scientific name, common name, known county records. Um, oh, there we go. So, you know, if you wanted to sort by family or sort, look at the, there, um, you can just click and sort. 
every for every species if there is county data in there i'm showing it <coughs> there's also a lot more information that's hidden in the default view of the website so if you go over to this hide show column section here you can click on that and then if you decide you know you could say i just want to look at genera so you turn off scientific names so you just toggle on and off and you could say um you know let's just show genera which doesn't really make sense in this case but um if you wanted to see the sources you could click and add the sources if you wanted to look at what synonyms are there which is a huge part of any um, taxonomic database is understanding and being able to see the synonyms um, and then notes about them which in this case is going to give you a lot of host data so Let's say you are interested in the red-necked cane borer, Agrilus rufacollis. You don't have any host data for that, but you know that it might also be cupercollis or impressiceps. If you're interested in the bayberry agrilus, you see the common name you want to know is what are the hosts of it? And it's not just bayberry, but it's also sweet fern. Uh, I think that, oh, right. The other thing, and we re, so, very recently added the source data, which is something that was really bugging me because I felt like I needed to be accountable for this data and where it came from, and also give credit where credit is due because it, this isn't data that I, for the most part, I mean, I am in here as a source, but most of this data came from other folks or other websites. So I'm trying not to cough here. All right. Um, so now if you click on any of the species, it expands the source section, or if you click again, it contracts it. So for example, Agrilus potatocollis, known county records are Middlesex and Worcester County, and you can see that the Middlesex County record came from GBIF, and you can see that the Worcester County record came from iNaturalist. Um, these are clickable, but they're just going to the main website they're not going to the actual record that is just beyond my capability right now um i think that's everything i wanted to show you guys i encourage you to explore it if there's if you're just curious like how many how many um cerambicids we have in um in massachusetts you could just type in any particular family or anything you're interested in or, or anything that mentions the word maple and you don't even have to hit enter it's automatically populating it with just a list of things that either have maple in the name or you know the this weevil that's called the applewood stainer you might think it just attacks apple but actually it's found on maple beech oak elm and other hardwoods and also there's a note here that it is attracted to uv light so i thought that kind of information was interesting and would be useful to folks um yeah, I think that's pretty much it. So I'm going to go back to my PowerPoint presentation because we are almost at time here. So I'm going to stop sharing. I just have a few more slides. Nope, that's not it. That's it. All right, hold on. No matter how many times I try this whole sharing, stop sharing thing, it's never smooth. It just never is. Okay, okay we, we've got it again. Yes, thank you very much. All right, so just a couple more slides here. So, so next steps, I still have so many more sources to go through. I need to do another data pull from Bug Guide and iNaturalist, as I mentioned before, uh, but I'm still going through the GBIF data set. Uh, GBIF, I had said it before, it's the Global Biodiversity Information Facility, is a database of databases. And so, it has connections to a lot of uh, entomology collections that don't necessarily have online access any other way. So it's been a really great resource. Um, although it's been interesting because in a few cases, I've discovered new sources because they were used in GBIF. And then I went through and went back to the original source and found that the GBIF data wasn't always correct. Um, I'm trying not to become obsessive about it because when you have 4,000 records, you're going to have some flubs in it. I mean, I've found at least 10 different mistakes in the 
in Harvard's Museum of Comparative Zoology database where they said there was a beetle record for a certain area and it wasn't true, including my discovery that there is apparently a town called Hyannis in Nebraska, um, which I discovered when they had a record for Hyannis of a beetle that had never been seen anywhere on the East Coast. And it just turned out it wasn't really Hyannis, Massachusetts, but someone had put it into the database like that. So things like that happen. They're going to happen in my database They if they happen in, in a Harvard database. Um, I have a couple more books to go through. And the other thing is that the more I talk about this database, the more I discover that there are lots of uh, entomologists and you know amateur entomologists and naturalists out there that have their own collections of data that they are hoarding and don't have online anywhere and I just hope that I can find as many of them as possible and convince them to share their data with me so I can get it into the database. Um, I know I do need to complete the the county level data and there's a few things we want to make better about the website within the next six months or so. Uh, so just some acknowledgements to round out the talk. Thank you to anybody who's ever contributed a beetle record or really any record into a citizen science database, uh, including folks who are, are sharing in, in some of the ID groups on Facebook that I tend to frequent. Thank you to Tom Murray and Don Chandler for sharing their records with me. Uh, thank you to Taya Montagna, because she was the reason that I started this project in the first place. She was the one I had that silly conversation with. Thank you to the Wellesley College Library, who patiently allowed me to have the two volume Downey and Arnett Beatles of Northeastern North America for many more months than I probably should have on interlibrary loan. But I finally returned it last week. So I'm very excited to have to be done with it, but also a little sad because you can't get that anywhere without paying like a thousand dollars for it it was nice to be able to look up id characters um, and most of all thank you to my husband chris foreman orth because there would be no massbeetles.com without his coding abilities maybe that's not exactly true maybe what i should say is that there would be a massbeetles.com but it would just be a website with a link to a big Adobe Acrobat file and it wouldn't be this amazing searchable database so so thank you for putting up with all of my um, feature requests and uh, doing all those bug fixes, so we could get this. Um, version two of the database online for you guys for this talk. And that's actually my last slide. I should have ended with like an amazing beetle photo, but I made you look at so many of my other photos, maybe it's better if we just go back to this. <laughs> Thank you very much. That was really terrific. Um, if there are questions, do you still have some voice left, Jen? Yeah. Okay. If there are any questions, you can un feel free to unmute yourself and fire away. Um, I guess one thing I would say while we're waiting for people to think of their questions, uh, I think when you do uh, get back to, to scraping out iNaturalist, you'll find that there's a lot of vineyard material there. One of the uh, things that my job consists of as the director of the Atlas of Life project is encouraging people to use iNaturalist. So we've started doing bio blitzes and having uh, informal natural history events that are aimed at uh, building iNaturalist skills. The, the Atlas of Life project, which pulls to, it's just a collection project that pulls together all the uh, records from MV, uh, has about a roughly 34,000 observations in it now, including 1,500 beetle observations. So nice. um, there, there is a lot of material there and things have, have uh, increased logarithmically or exponentially uh, the, the amount of data that we're getting down here, so. Yeah, I mean, I feel like I was seeing that in iNaturalist from you guys. One of the things that I didn't want to get into the nitty gritty of it with iNat, but <laughs> I'm only pulling research grade observations. Yeah. So if somebody hasn't agreed that it is what someone says it is, I don't want to put it in there. And I know that that's not even perfect, but. Yeah. And then, and the problem is that there just aren't that many people who are good at beetle ID and beetles are often <laughs> really hard to identify to the species level from a photograph. 
Yes. Yeah, so, that, that is so. another thing I, I didn't talk about, which is that citizen science data is great. I love the idea that you can get data from photos, but there's definitely a certain subset of the beetle fauna that you'll never be able to get to species with just photos. You need to have specimens collected and they need to be examined under a scope or you need to do like a dissection of some kind. And we're getting better because camera equipment's getting better and the knowledge base is getting better, but there really is just, you know, there's just certain things that you're not going to find in iNaturalist or bug guide except like to the genus level. Yeah. Any questions from anybody? Sharon, dive right in. Hi. <laughs> That's a terrible echo. I don't know how we can stop that. <laughs> um, it would be interesting to know if there are things that you are looking for, either through Matt, where he connects us all down here. If there are certain things that you that you're thinking, uh, people should be looking for this this particular beetle because I'm out there, you know, duffing around and trying to figure out stuff on my own. And sometimes I overlook things, I would think. So uh, is there any way, are you interested from time to time in certain species that you would like people to look for? That's a really good question. I mean, one of the things that I thought was interesting was looking at um, when the records are really old and no one's seen it for like a hundred years or something. And so there's a way to pull that data from mass beetles and the other thing is that now that i've been collecting more of the you know in the notes i've been collecting habitat data i think it would be really cool to look into any species that say they're coastal that are that we don't have vineyard records for and whether they could be found i think that would be really cool but you know other than that i feel like the database is just kind of getting to the point where it's mostly complete, you know, like it's, it's never going to be totally complete, but maybe that's a, a conversation I can keep having with Matt about filling in those gaps. Yeah, and that's also the kind of question, Sharon, that, uh, you know, you could, you're equipped to answer for yourself. I mean, as you start rummaging around in a database like Mass Beetles, you know, you'll come across a beetle that is listed for every county except Dukes or, you know, any any kind of thing like that, that that catches your attention. And then you can do a little bit of research, you know, go to Bug Guide, uh, find the species account on Bug Guide and find out something about its habitat associations. And Bob's your uncle, you know, you're off, you can, can find a place and go looking for it. So, I mean, that's... Uh, that's kind of how it works. And I think there are more and more people on the vineyard who are getting to the point where their, their level of curiosity and their naturalist skills are, you know, able to, to, to go through that kind of process. Other questions? Thank you. All right, uh, this I, is Ali. Yeah, I have a question um, for Jen and for Matt in terms of iNaturalist. Do you have any specific recommendations in terms of uh, parts of the beetles that should be photographed more closely than others for ID purposes, and then whether or not um, information about the plant that the beetle is found in should also be incorporated in the notes or somewhere else on iNaturalist, you know, some information that Jen could potentially pull from a host plant or habitat perspective. That is such a good question and point. Um, the first part is, well, setting aside that a lot of times beetles are not cooperative about this and you might only get one shot before it scoots off or plays dead and falls off of whatever it was on when you're trying to photograph it. If it is cooperating, it, I don't know, it's funny. A lot of times when people send stuff to me at work for ID, it's, the underside of the insect and I always just think to myself like you, you really didn't know that wasn't going to be enough like it's just something sitting there with its legs up in front of its face so really 
in a world where digital photography is cheap and they're not charging you to upload, you should have a top view and a side view. And if it's possible, the underside. Now, if you're, if it's really a patient insect and you have really good camera equipment, a lot of beetles can be ID'd in part by characters on what they call the, the clippius, which is basically the front of its face. So if you're able to get a good enough macro shot of the beetle staring directly at you, that can be really useful too. But also certain beetles, the, the ID characters are in what they call the, the tarsi or the leg parts. So if you have really good camera equipment or you're able to like put it in a dissecting scope and, and look at the feet, that can help too. So yeah, just just 10 or 12 pictures of each insect for ID. <laughs> Nothing, no big deal. But that honestly, that really is what it comes down to for a lot of species. In terms of host plants, I mean, I don't pay a lot of attention to what iNaturalist puts in their description pages. So maybe they're already putting host stuff in, but what I'll say to the end user, like if you're taking a picture of an insect, either take a picture of what you found it on, especially if it's a plant or make a note so that you can say when you upload it as an observation, I saw this on milkweed, I saw this on an oak, because that often makes a difference. So just all, I try to add that information whenever I can. I even will say if I found something like in a pitfall trap versus at a black light versus just, you know, in the grass. Like, I think that that, you know, use that notes field. If you're using iNaturalist and if you're using bug guide, or even if you're, if you're posting in an ID group on social media, like that's right away. That's, that's what people want to know. They want to know where geographically, where habitat, what the date was, <laughs> and host plant information if you have it. Especially because with insects, you're often zooming way in on the insect and it's not obvious what the plant is that it's on unless you tell somebody or zoom out and take a shot of it. There are also data fields in iNaturalist and I, I, I can't go into them now. We really don't have time and I'm not prepared to do it but you can uh, add, create data fields like host plant or plant association. And then when somebody does a data download, they can actually include that information in the spreadsheet that they, that they have iNaturalist generate. So um, that's a, a thing to explore and to, to look into with iNaturalist. I, I second the, uh, for any kind of insect, um, multiple angles is really important. You just don't know what the diagnostic characteristics are going to be in any particular case. You know, in, in one beetle, it's like, it's the tarsal segments. In the next beetle, it's the, the, the punctures between the ridges on the elytra. You know, you just don't know. So the more images you can get and the higher quality of those images are, the better the chance that somebody's going to be able to identify it to genus or even species level. Yeah, there was a weevil that I took out of my slideshow because I couldn't ID it. And I spent like an hour last night trying to ID it to species <laughs> because the difference is it's like Lixis concavus versus Lixis mucidus. And concavus has a weird depression in the head. So it like sinks down. And mucidus also has one, but not as deep. That's what the ID is. It's like, you know how hard it is to tell like how much of a depression is in the head of something with I didn't have good enough photos so it's just going to stay at the genus level but you try your best the other thing is look don't sometimes it's not going to go to to species and that's okay that's just it's still information that you found the genus of something oh I'm feeling really bad that I didn't know about those fields and iNaturalist I have not been using them the no. host info oh well yeah <laughs> I, I feel your pain, though, about uh, difficulty identifying things. And I think a lot of people get into insect study from being birders to start with. And it takes some adjustment of your attitude. You know, as a birder, if you get to be a pretty good birder, almost every vocalization that you hear and every bird that you get, even a halfway decent look at, you can instantly identify to the species level. 
And it just isn't that way with Beatles. There are a lot of times when all I can do is it, it's a, is, is a family level ID. And of course, one of the cool things about both Bug Guide and iNaturalist is that there are people who know more than you do about any of these uh, taxonomic groups. And over the, the course of time, a lot of times somebody will be able to narrow it down. And that's really, uh, uh, it's, it's amazing to me how the, uh, the internet has reshaped insect study. It's just been a revolution over the last 10 or 15 years. Uh, things that were completely impossible or required an advanced degree in something in order to be able to get anywhere is now easy for anybody with a digital camera and, and an internet connection. So these are the golden days of nature study. It really is. And it's just so much fun. I'm having so much fun. <laughs> <laughs> I really am. And I All hope right, everybody I... out there taking pictures is too. <laughs> yeah. All right. I think I'm going to end things there. Uh, we've, we've been sitting for a long time and we need to stretch our legs and probably go get something to eat. But I'd like to thank you all again for coming and uh, sharing some time with us. I'd like to thank Jen profusely for not just this webinar, but for all the help that she's given me over the years. That's very much appreciated. And uh, get out there, get your, your camera, get your phone camera, uh, photograph stuff, put it in iNaturalist. Thanks, everyone. Bye, everybody.